much for inviting me here. It's been a really great um, symposium, and I'm, I'm really glad to see so many people here. I'm a bit surprised, but it's uh, it's really really nice. Yeah. So I, I promised to uh, talk a little bit about another role that fish can have, and and uh, then just food. And we'll see if I, I can convince you of that. We've heard. Uh, snapshots of that today as well. Uh, fish having a, a role in the food web, of course. Um, but uh, we go, we're going to get a little bit deeper into this. So, um, my name is Anna Tarnos, and I'm uh, currently um, uh, uh, employed by Obo Kemi uh, in Finland, the same place as Martin. But I'm working in, in Copenhagen in Denmark together with the guys uh, at Ocean Life, the Center for o Ocean Life, uh, which is part of the Danish Technical University. Um, so fish more than just food. This is how we usually uh, think and uh, um, think about food, uh, fish. At least I, we mainly come back to the populations and the stocks and so on at these kind of fish um, symposiums. Um, but fish is much more than that. Um, and you can wonder why I'm starting with a, a weird picture from on the seafloor. But this is to introduce myself a little bit. I'm a benthic ecologist, so this is a familiar picture to me. Um, uh, I've been mostly working with, with macrofauna, uh, the thing that the fish eat mostly. Um, but nowadays I oh, have also stepped into uh, some research about fish and how we link these two together, the macrofauna and the fish. And this is uh, this seafloor picture that you can see here is actually has a lot to do with fish <coughs> because it's um, actually um, feeding pits made by rays. And this could be this is rays now, but it could also be uh, flounder that we have here. And um, the interesting thing is here that the fish is, has nothing to do with food here, but they are excellent biturbators. They do disturb the sediment, and this is very important for, for um, sediment transport uh, and also for the organisms that live in the, in the sediment. They dig for the food um, and they disturb it and thereby also release nutrients, for example, to the environment uh, and they affect the nutrient fluxes in the sediment. Um, I was at a conference last week uh, where this was a, a big problem, or not a problem, it's a challenge, for the acousticians, because um, they do, when fish come in, you can have nice ripples and you can make the nice uh, acoustic map that you want to do, but the instant fish, fishes come in, they do tend to uh, disturb, disturb, disturb the, the nice ripples, sand ripples, for example, that you have, and this is a great problem for them. Um, so I thought it was a quite interesting uh, uh, link here between uh, fish perturbation and how we can s sort of sense the marine environment and the problems and challenges that that can come up because I hadn't really thought about that. That's a sidestep, so let's get back to it. Um, Biotubation by fish is one role that the fish can have, but uh, mostly we've been he hearing today about fish being a central part of the food web, and that's of course another role that the fish can have. Without fish here, uh, we would have quite a different picture of the food web, so, um, uh, looking at fish from, from this perspective is very important as well. Uh, they do, uh, depending on where you, where you look at your fish communities and, uh, and which one you sample and you study, uh, you tend to either um, look at the more pelagic uh, food web, where you have the energy going up from, from microalgae, uh, up to zooplankton and, and uh, up to the predator fishes that we can see on, on the trophic position 4 there, for example. Or a more uh, benthic uh, driven system where you have the macrofauna that live on the seafloor uh, eating detritus and going up to benthic feeding fishes and so on. Um, so fish already here has quite different roles in the system, in the food web. And you can keep this in mind as we go forward. Um, so fish are goods and services to us. They are goods in terms of that we can we can go out and harvest them. We can get them as food, but and services you could say because they uphold this uh, food web in many ways, and they are services because they are very important also in biotubating, uh, not just the macrofauna that lives on the sediment, but also fish is uh, an important biotubator here. So two examples of what they are. 
what kind of functional roles they would also have, just them being uh, food for us. Um, <clears throat> in this presentation, we're going to look at the fish community, not specifically one species of fish, but rather the whole community that you go out and, and measure. Uh, and because the fish and the fish community, um, or the community of fish, um, do have these important roles as as goods and services to us, I think it's a very important um, uh, important point to, for us to safeguard this. But how do we monitor these communities, in a way, uh, in, and in the best way? We heard a little bit already about that. Um, but there's, there's some other ways we can look into to this fish community than just the traditional measures that we do. What we usually go, go out and do when we want to know um, uh, the state of the fish community is to go out and calculate how many uh, or measure how many species there are, the diversity of this fish community, <coughs> and how many there are, how many fish per, per each species there are out there. And this we can do uh, by either going out in the coastal areas and using um, multi nets and various yeah, nets, uh, gill nets and so on. And out, out in the open ocean, um, we uh, tend to use uh, these uh, trawls and so on. So this, this is things that we, we can easily do, and this, this, we have monitoring programs for, for measuring these kind of things. But the question is, uh, why do we need so many species um, to upheld these goods and services? Why do we want the high diversity, other than it's just nice that it's a, a lot of different fishes that we can eat? Um, well, there's this theory of an, the insurance hypothesis that if we have a lot of species in the system, if one becomes extinct, for example, we fish it away or, or it, the whole population is great, then someone else can come in and take that place. For example, in the food web, if one is lost, one species is lost, another one can come in and, and upheld that food web. Um, so, um, but that requires that we know what the, the fishes in the community does, and it also uh, requires that we know uh, how they differ, these, dif these fishes differ between them, each other, what their roles really are in the system. And if you can, you can look at these two communities that I've put up here and uh, take a moment to think how they would differ in terms of the traditional measures and in terms of maybe their role in the system. Are they so different after all? Um, we could calculate how many different species there are. What would you say, how many are there? Is there a difference between the communities? Not really, there's one, two, three, four species there, right? In both of the communities. Um, do we have a different number of individuals in these communities? <coughs> and in these, within these species, not really, right? Quite different, but they look, they look different to me, the communities, right? Um, we have pike and we have um, we have cod, we have flatfishes there, yes, but they are two different species, but the thing is, do the flatfishes do the same thing here? Um, we have other benthic feeding fishes, um, but they are not the same species. So how do we go about investigating this? How do we go about knowing what the different roles of the fish really are? Um, we can use traits. Um, that is their characteristics. We can have a look at these uh, kind of things to know what their roles are. Um, this is a continuation of the com concept that we, we mostly all and still are mostly in interested in the species. But we have been starting to group them into, well, this, I already said the flat fishes, um, the farts that eat from the bottom, the ones that eat in the pelagic. Uh, the different tropic groups, we had the ones that was on a, a higher <coughs> tropic group, the predators, uh, from the ones that are uh, feeding uh, lower down in the trophic uh, the food web. Uh, so we have this, this trophic group, functional group, um, way of looking at things. This, this has been around for some time already. But the new thing is, is maybe to look at their specific characteristics that are called traits. Uh, and this is 
uh, one way of looking at, at a trait-based approach that I'm going to talk about much more here. You look at the species, you go out to sample the community, and um, you can then start to dig in uh, and look at their behavior, their life history, um, and, and how, do they, how they look like, the morphology of the species, because they, these things can tell quite a lot about what the, the roles of the species in the system. And uh, the idea is that you, these traits can't all be there uh, at the same time. There's the environment that decides if it's, um, if it's, um, that if it's okay to be in this system. For example, um, uh, in, in, if you're looking at the seafloor, uh, a, a fish that has that is very high and swims very far, fast and have an upright position is not probably adapted to that type of environment. So you, it's very to have a flat uh, body form, for example, and also have the, the mouth uh, is probably quite different from one that swims around and feeds in the pelagic. So the, the environment is filtering out what kind of um, morphology and so on and so on that you, you can have in that system. Um, and so, let's come back to what is a trait. Well, there's many different, uh, different um, definitions out there. The one that I'm going to use here in this presentation and that I also use in my research is that it's any morphological, physiological, phenological or behavioral uh, characteristic measured preferably on an individual level. And, or it should be a, possible to, to measure it on an individual level. So here are some examples of the traits that I'm going to, to uh, use and show you how we can use them in, in our research. Um, the diet or trophic gill, that's one uh, very important trait, I would say, if we want to know something about their role in the food web. The body shape, um, that says something about the habitat, but also about the diet and how they eat. Um, the cardinal shape, uh, that says something about their swimming activity. The length is always interesting and it's often also measured. And it has to do with the growth of the fish and the food web, again, where, where, it sort of, uh, in, where is it placed in the food web, and the metabolism, and so on. And also fecundity is a very interesting because that tells us about the turnover of this, um, this uh, species in the system. Um, so how do you link then species to their characteristics and traits? Well, you can go out and measure, as I said, for example, size. That's a continuous one. That's easy to go out and measure uh, size of the species many times and so on, and, and treat it in, in, as a continuous measure. But some of the traits, you can't really uh, measure all, all traits that's on a continuous scale. So, so you, what you can do instead is to, to do, categorize them into different groups again. And you can use a sort of um, fuzzy coding into, to getting this information into a numerical information that we can later take into our analysis. So for example, you have the a feeding type, <coughs> and which you, can, you can't really uh, put on a, on a continuous scale here. So you can, do, you can divide it into different categories. You have piscivores, platyvores, and bentivores normally. And what you can do is that we know some species are definitely a piscivore. Um, some species are definitely a bentivore, and it gets, uh, and some are a bit of both. This is a generalist species, so we know it can be eat fish, but it can also it's main, mainly a bentivore species. So you can see that you can have scale from zero to three. This is usually what we have, but you can also just have a presence absence here. But the thing is, you can get the information uh, that is. Uh, the information into numerical um, data that we can use in, in, in um, analysis later on. So, how do you use this great information then? Well, what you usually go out and measure, and what you get from all kinds of troll surveys and so on, is that you have the species and then you have the different size that you've been having. This is the normal data. Uh, but uh, then you can look at the species list that you have and start to assemble these traits, the characteristics that you want to, are particularly interested in. Um, and how do you do that then? Well, one important source for us working with this is actually fish based, so I'm very pleased to be here just because of that. 
uh, to thank, to thank uh, Fishbeck for being a really great um, place to find this kind of information. Um, but there's also other sources out there uh, that we huge databases that are continuously working into getting much more information like this in, uh, available to researchers. Um, so when you have uh, assembled the different traits that you want to look at, and we can come back to discussing about which trait to use and so on, um, these two um, ta tables uh, you can, you can um, put together. Uh, you can also, yeah, I'm going to say, you can also use CPUE or the biomass of the, the features here to, in order to get a weighted, um, weighted measure in the end. I'll go back to that. But what you want to really go at uh, and look at is when you have what kind of traits do you have at different sites, because that can tell us something about uh, the changes in the environment and how that um, affects the, 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 the functional, uh, fish functional um, community. I'll come back to that later on. Um, so, by using these sites and traits, you can calculate various indices and measures. We are very fam most of you are probably familiar with the, the traditional ones, such as species richness and species diversity. But we can also, when we have this type of information, we can start looking into the functional trait diversity or the functional trait richness of a community. And this is interesting because you can look at it ov over space, sort of in different environments. So you can look at it back in time, which I'm also going to show a little bit some examples of today. You can also uh, calculate this kind of measure, which is a community-weighted mean, uh, it's called, and that's when you use the biomass or the abundance of the species, and you get sort of a, a weighted um, sum of a trait. You know how ma much of, or how many, or how much there is of, of this specific feeding type, for example, or this specific um, uh, body form and so on. So you can start uh, looking into the different traits with a much more quantitative measure. So, <coughs> then to the examples. Um, I'm going to show you some different ones here. First, the first one is uh, a, a, a study that we did not too long ago, where we asked what is the pattern uh, of fish trait diversity in the Baltic Sea, and why is it uh, looking like, like it does. The other one is just a, a very short and quick example of trait biogeography that we could come at with this type of um, um, uh, information. We are used to looking at species biogeography, uh, bio but we can also start to look into much more of a, um, a functional understanding uh, using trait biogeography. And the, the third one is uh, something I'm working on at the moment, and that is looking at uh, changes of these uh, functional measures over time asking how has the fish functional trait diversity changed over time in the Baltic Sea. Um, so, to the first study, um, we looked at uh, how fish diversity, and this is uh, only demersal fish, uh, have changed in the Baltic Sea and why, and what are the drivers. And this is uh, work that I've done uh, with colleagues at the Center for Ocean Life. Um, and this is out, so you can go and have a look at that if you want in more detail. The motivation behind this was that um, we know in the Baltic Sea there's a decline in species richness when you go from south to the northern parts. That's true for all of the groups, more or less, uh, especially for macro um, that we I have been looking into um, much more um, prior to this study, but also fish. Um, there's also a, sal a strong salinity gradient that is probably the one that is mostly driving the community composition. That's certainly the thing for, for macrofauna and macrosubentos. But is that the same for fish? That's the question here. Um, ma uh, some of the studies that have been looking at this prior, prior to, to what we wanted to do um, was, uh, and especially getting at the functional uh, changes over this gradient from the Kattegat Skagrak area up uh, all the way up into the Bothnian Bay was a study that we did in <coughs> 2015 um, where we looked at macrosubentos and uh, we divided them rather than having specific numbers we divided uh, the the species uh, the communities and the species um, or the 
number of species into these richness groups that you can see on the x-axis. So we have most species, of course, out in the Skagera Kattegat area. And then it drops, as you can see on this uh, blue uh, line that's in there, when you come into the Baltic Sea. And that we heard about already today, that that's a huge decline when you come into the Baltic Sea. Um, so you have a 96% reduction in taxa when you when you if in the area in Skagerrak Kattegat and compared to when you go up into the Botnian Sea uh, on Botnian Bay furthest up north quite the, you would ex as you would expect but the question was um, do we see this decline as well in in trait richness <coughs> and in in the number of trait categories that were expressed and if you focus on the gray bars here we can see versus the white ones we can see that that wasn't Necessarily so. Uh, you had only a 34% reduction in trade categories, which means that 66% uh, of the, the trades that were there in the Kattegat and Skagerrak area were actually expressed all the way up in the Botnian Bay by, I might say, uh, only six taxa. So that's quite interesting. So you don't lose necessarily um, the functioning of the system. You don't lose the here uh, expressed by trade category uh, number of trades that you have um, although you have a lot less species so that was quite interesting and we wondered is this the same for fish or how does it look like yeah and I should say that uh, when we move up into the Botnian Sea we get uh, the species get more similar in in uh, traits when because that's a measure that you see on this other y-axis here it's a functional diversity uh, measure and that tells us about trait similarity so uh, you have much more similar um, trait composition when you move up into the to Botnian, uh, Botnian Bay there. Well this study then it we looked had data from the Baltic International Troll Survey um, but we focus only on the demersal fish here so this is number of holes um, from 2003 to 2004 in February March so this is just basically for you to, because they're going to be these round circles in later pictures as well. So just to know you where, where we are. Um, these are the traits that we included. We went through it already. Um, there's th five traits uh, that we included in the study. And uh, the data, the, the traits that we, the information of these traits was actually taken mostly from fish base. So, so it was a, it's a very handy tool. And this is how it looks like. When we calculate species richness, which is the traditional measure, um, uh, we have most species out in the Skagar area, as you would expect, and then it declines uh, when we come into the Baltic Sea. And uh, the functional richness number of traits is also um, similar to this, but you can see that the patterns do not really uh, match up uh, one to one there. But we also have quite of a high um, functional richness also in the southern Baltic, uh, Baltic Sea here. Um, we also wanted to look at what's the drivers behind this and uh, of course salinity uh, explained um, a very high percentage also of the functional richness here, 54 percent, which was not so surprising to us. Um, but then we started to f think about what are the mechanisms that influence how the community assembles, the composition of the community. Um, is it environmental filtering as we would have expected with salinity? Uh, is it so that all communities are, uh, are um, driven and, and assembled only by this salinity, the, the decrease in salinity here? So you would have an, um, a community where similar are very uh, uh, species are very similar, they have low trait richness, they are very similar in, in between them. Share. Or could we have this type of uh, hypothesis that we, which is called limiting similarity, that you have an, a community where you have a strong competition between species uh, and species are dissimilar that says that they have high trait richness. They're very different from each other. Or a neutral, we can test it also with a neutral, it's called a null model here. Um, uh, and this is how you can see you have the null model if if um, species are l uh, if our data will be plotted underneath this curve then we would have an environmental filtering going on here is it plotted above the curve we would have this other um, 
um, thing going on called limiting similarity, that the species are very different from each other. And this is how, how it looks like. Um, <coughs> most of our data are above this, um, uh, or sort of, uh, yeah, actually prone to this limiting similarity that we would have a lot of, it's not only the environment that drives the composition of the species in this community, but actually the, com uh, the interactions between the species. So that is uh, quite, and when you plot it out and see where this happens, uh, most of the limiting similarity uh, idea uh, that species are very different from each other happens inside the Baltic Sea, while we have this very strong environmental um, driver, uh, particularly in the Skagara Kattegat area, which is what you would expect. But the question was what really happens when you come into the Baltic Sea, and there the salinity driver is not as prone as we would have expected. Um, and then we also looked at the biomass, if you take this biomass into consideration, um, biomass of the species, um, and we calculated these um, functional dissimilarities, but taking in consideration the, the biomass, um, to quantify how similar or dissimilar two species um, when you take into consideration also the biomass, not just the traits. And um, here, when you have uh, on sort of blue greenish then you there's a map coming after this so that's why i'm plotted this like this but when you have this type of uh, function dissimilarity uh, oi, uh numbers between zero zero point two then you have very uh, similar species and when you have higher numbers um functional dissimilarity then you have very different species um so when you have this this is also true when we take into consideration biomass, not just when we look at traits per se, but also when we figure, take into consideration and weigh the, the traits, that we have these um, very different uh, sp species are very different in the, the southern, southwestern Baltic Sea than when we have uh, out in the Kattegat Skagerrak area. So, um, there's a strong environmental control. We know that. We did. We did know that. Uh, and salinity is the one that is driving it in, in particular. Uh, but the functional richness was lower than expected in the relatively species-rich Western Baltic Sea. Uh, while it's relatively high in the species-poor Baltic proper. And both, if we look at the only the presence of the trait, the expression of the trait, but when we take into consideration the um, the abundance of the biomass, it had an east-west difference in the process controlling community composition. So it's not only the environment, but also something else that uh, uh, dictates the community composition here. Um, then I promised a, a quick uh, example of how you can use traits to uh, look at much wider, um, on much wider scales. Here is a study that is in preparation that Loren is looking into specific traits. You can again use this community-weighted mean where you're taking into consideration how much uh, of the, the species there are. But this is, I think, ma mainly just plotted with the traits. And look, because this is very interesting when you want to, for example, also manage an area. You want to know not specifically where a species is, but know where we have benthic feeding fishes. If you're going to set up a troll survey, for example, or build something on the bottom, sea bottom, that this is very important. Um, so we can start to look into traits like in this way as well, <coughs> using, using this kind of information. Here we have lifespan all the way up uh, in, in from Iceland, we have data, and you can see that from Baltic Sea and the North Sea is quite different here, and this is something that we are investigating at the moment. Then uh, to the uh, last example that I have is um, a study on long-term functional trends in the Baltic Sea. And looking at both coastal uh, macrofauna and fish, and I'm going to present only the fish part here now. Um, and the aim was to assess the temporal uh, development on functional trait structure. And we asked ourselves, can changes and shifts in taxonomic structure also be identified in this functional structure? We use data, uh, we have data, um, a 40 year time series, which is quite interesting. Uh, we have that both for macrofauna and fish, and it's, although the Baltic Sea is very st much studied, um, having these two uh, types of, of um, taxonomic groups together sampled is 
not the case really in the Baltic Sea, and that's something that we need to to uh, give to the managers uh, a hint about to maybe form some more better monitoring in that sense that we would have all the different tropic groups in in the same place sample at the same time because we have data now from uh, three areas um, uh, in from the Kattegat area from the Baltic proper and from the Botnian Bay um, but it's only at, a, at three different stations that we have this 40 year time series we used uh, we had six fi six fish and six bento bentic traits and we did s more or less the same analysis that I've just presented. Uh, we looked at the taxonomic uh, richness, uh, the taxonomic measures, richness, abundance, and so on. And we calculated the functional richness, divergence, and evenness, and so on. Um, and to look at the changes in time, and that's what I'm going to uh, give you a, an example of here today, we used uh, various um, analyses, PCA, and so on. I can get back to that if you have questions. So the study sites here are these these three areas, um, the Kattegat Skagerrak area, the Bo Bo Baltic proper, and the Botnian Sea. And when we look at um, just the, the traditional measures, sort of uh, ta taxonomic richness, we uh, that's the, the black dots here, you can see that there's an increase in some of these areas, but not it's not the same increase in all areas. That also is an important thing for managers to, and they do realize it, that we have to manage Baltic Sea differently, de uh, depending on which basin you're talking about. But there's not the same trend in all, all of the um, different areas. In the Botnian Sea, we had an increase in the 1980s of species coming in. Uh, then you also have this, uh, and that's also identified when the gray dots here, which is the turnover of how fast uh, species come and go. So this is something that is quite uh, what we expected. But what about then the functional measures? And do we see changes? Can we identify changes here? And we can. Uh, the red uh, lines here indicate where our analysis could indicate uh, find shifts, where there's been certain shifts in um, in in the functional uh, structure, um, it's not. These are this this uh, analysis that we've done is to find specific shifts, sort of. Um, but it's not the trends that you can see here. It's not so that there's. Uh, it's more of a continuous trend than a um, ecosystem change shift that we've that there are uh, that people have found, especially in the open uh, water, that we have this huge shift where the whole system have changed. That's not something that we can see in these coastal areas, really. It's more of a continuous trend. trend. Um, and we can also visualize it in, in various ways. And, and these red dots show us that some of these traits do change over time. And the question is, of course, which ones does it? Which ones uh, do change? And what does that mean for us then? What does, how do we understand the system in a better way by looking at the traits? Well, um, <coughs> the ones traits that are, are um, have been changing over time is, is also different, especially between the Kattegat area. Uh, and the Baltic proper and Botnian Sea are more or less the same type of, of change we can see. There's the, the mersol um, fishes that lay eggs that's come in. Um, uh, there's the ones that, um, uh, especially bentopelagic living uh, species, have uh, come in in the Baltic proper. While in the Botnian Sea, planktivorous feeding fishes have also gone up. Um, uh, later on, which we have also already basically heard about, but we've heard about it on a species level, not uh, uh, depicted like this. Um, so, um, yeah, so um, this study have shown that, um, yes, there are specific changes that we can look at also in the functional structure, not only in how many species that have come in and what species have gone out and, and come back, but um, that the, the, tra the trends are more of a continuous ones. It's not the big regime shifts that we can see in the offshore areas, but more uh, continuous trends. And um, by using traits, we can understand much more of what's happening in the community than just uh, species coming and going. 
And this is going to be much more informative, perhaps, to, to give to managers to say, what kind of community do we have here? Is it um, sh should we focus more on the monitoring and, and understanding the, the on, on uh, benthic, uh, benthic feeding fishes than, for example, a pelagic uh, community um, and so on. But the take-home messages that I would like to, to give to you uh, today is that, and I hope I've, I've shown you some examples where fish is much more than just food, and that's someone, many of you have already shown that today, there's much more to, to fish than food. Um, traits can tell us mo more than traditional measures about the structure and patterns and the changes of communities. Um, and uh, environmentally, uh, the environmental control is f still the driver, of course, of fish tr uh, functional um, richness uh, in the Baltic Sea, as we would expect, but uh, not necessarily in the entire. When you come into the Baltic Sea, that's another dif uh, different different uh, thing, perhaps, as we had uh, lower richness in the Western Baltic Sea than expected, and uh, another east-west gradient in community composition when we look at the functional composition of the community that we didn't really expect. And that shift in functional diversity are identifiable, just as uh, shifts in, in species composition. Um, but there's definitely differences between the basins that we have to take into consideration. And, um, and yes, that was what I wanted to say here. So uh, acknowledges to the collaborators. There's been many <coughs> over the years here. And uh, also to the funding agencies that I'm currently on. And this is the EU bonus project, BioC3, if you want to look up and have an interest more um, in depth and uh, look at that. That's up um, on the web page as well. Thank you so much. <coughs> Thanks a lot, Anna. Interesting talk. Some questions here. Oh, Nathan, go on. Is it on? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm always appreciating big data analyses as a molecular biologist dealing with sequencing data because I think there's lots of power in those analyses. And then yet I remember an example that we had on analyzing food webs ourselves and traits and round goby and perch. And we found that, yes, perch is a predator of round goby in terms of traits. Yeah. It's a larger fish and so on. And then when perch were juvenile, they were victims of round goby. So they completely switched roles yeah. during their life because their traits changed so much. And I, I think there's many fish where some of the traits that you measured would change fundamentally yeah. from larval stage to adult. Yeah. Can you incorporate this kind of information in the trait databases that you do? Um, yeah, I've had the same challenge uh, with macrofauna. They also, they also switch. Uh, what they do, of course, when they grow and so on. And yes, you can incorporate it, um, depend either from the start of uh, taking also the juvenile data in, or then um, doing, it, for example, taking juvenile traits in. Uh, you can have some of the reproductive uh, traits uh, that are focusing on, on more the juvenile in order, if, if that's the question you want to go at. And with these traits, it's also a subject, it's a subjective thing what, what kind of traits you take in, but the what traits you analyze and what traits you want to put together. Um, based on what I presented now, uh, the idea is that it's your question that decides what you want to look at. Um, so what you're after decides what kind of traits you are. There's also another trait approach uh, that I've not talked about here, but that take into, into consideration the connections between traits in a different way. And that's looking uh, into the fundamental um, principles that uh, an organism needs to do. It needs to feed, it needs to uh, reproduce, and it needs to uh, survive. And you can't, as an uh, organism, do this uh, all at the same time. So there's a trade-off between uh, eat and getting eaten, so to speak. And this is also how you can start disentangle uh, the, 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 the interlinkage between these traits. And that could be a, a one way of... of uh, of going forward, especially with these life history traits. Gustav, 
Well, <clears throat> I have a question that could perhaps be related to management. Um, mm. Because you said that something else than, than the environmental factors were um, uh, probably behind this difference mm. in, in, in functional uh, structure mm. that you saw between Western and Eastern mm. uh, Baltic. And I mean, human pressures would be quite yeah, likely, right? And the fisheries, yeah. for, for example. And uh, how and could you evaluate that and investigate it? Uh, yeah, I, I said, and it's uh, the other thing that's happening in the Baltic Sea, as I said, is probably between species, species competition, but we as uh, humans are probably also competing there. And uh, how we could incorporate it in these specific, or how we could see and analyze it in these specific um, instances, I guess we can take in some of the pressures, for example, trolling pressure or uh, fishing pressure as a general uh, uh, variable into this analysis and see how that changed. That's also something we have thought about, especially if we would have a long time series looking into that. Uh, but then it's depending on if you want to look at a specific species, but but looking at, for example, the coastal fish communities, this is something that we have been talk thinking about, taking in fishing pressure as a variable. Uh, that's probably doable, yes. Uh, taking it into consideration um, when we choose traits, um, for example, choose traits to analyze. We probably want to look at more of the life form, perhaps, uh, which different groups have changed over time. If you have a fishing pressure or if you have uh, yeah, various different fishing pressures, for example, uh, it's probably going to go after, uh, well, the, the big fishing company is probably going to go after the, the demersal fishes and using traits to look at that, while uh, the recreational fishing pressure is, might have uh, affected another type of group, for example, maybe some of the more predatory fishes that live in the um, pelagic or pelagic predatory fishes and so on. So there could, would probably be signals about that as well, using this type of analysis. And it would say more than just having which species, species are caught. Any more questions? Nothing more? Yeah, okay. You'll get back to me if there's any. Yes, just want to say thank you, Anna, for again, nice, nice talk and interesting results. Oh, Thanks thank a you. lot. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>